Good morning. I want to thank everyone who's had part this morning. I have enjoyed the service this far. I'm going to attempt to share a message this morning that's by request. It's one that uh, I had shared when I was away from meetings, and some of you found out that I shared it there and requested we would have it here sometime. So I guess that's where we're at this morning. It's the subject of child training. It's a subject that's not real popular today. And it's also a subject that I shared out there and it, I tried to condense it this morning. I was given quite a bit more time there and probably still went over time. And so I'm going to try to just bump over quite a few of the points that I had and not go into a lot of detail, but uh, I hope it can be an encouragement for us. I, I don't stand here as one that has the answers. I've made many mistakes. And my children are this morning what they are in spite of me, not because of me. And I want you to know that. I also have learned a lot of things even since my children are small. And a lot of things that I would do different had I the chance to do it over again. And it seems like life is sort of unfair in some ways. God expects parents to sort of raise their children without any training. And it seems like they're kind of put in there without experience. And sometimes that's good, but I think we also need some encouragement at times to give direction. And I know some of you have small children. Some of us are past that stage. Some of us are not there yet. But I think it's good to be encouraged in that. Um, but there's a lot of things that happen in our society. It seems like we're in a society that has been... Um, has been affected, even churches are affected by the society around us, say it that way. Uh, back, if you go back in the 50s and 60s, there was a hippie movement that rose up and it was kind of an anti-authoritarian movement. And maybe things were lopsided the other direction, but they went to the direction where is anti-anything that was established, basically. And it has caused an effect on a lot of homes and even homes in the church. And uh, as we look at society and as we look at the people around us in general, we see a lot of young people no longer attending church. And there have been a lot of studies done on this and, and uh, have come to quite some conclusions, but they're finding out a lot of things. And, and one of the things is, is that the lack of a father figure in a home has greatly contributed to this. That's one of the things they came up with as, as uh, a reason why they're facing this. Another is the lack of education as far as spiritual education. Understanding scripture, basically. Understanding the plan of salvation. And they have gone so far that, well, we know what a lot of churches do. They have youth pastors and all kinds of ways to teach children and whatever and I'm just skimming over this, but they've come to the point where uh, this group that has studied this have discovered that a lot of young people today do not even understand the plan of salvation good enough that they could explain it. In other words, they have a theological, uh, their theological understanding of the new birth is such that they don't even really understand exactly what happens and that's a shame that's a shame it's a lack of teaching basically and they're taught oh yes you need to be born again and you accept Christ as your savior but they really don't have a concept of really how what what happened and really what that means for them theologically and because of that there the statistics are because of that uh, this group feels that that's a big problem. And if we see churches trying to step in and take care of that problem, but I think myself, the problem probably is from the home, not from the church. You see, we can take children and put them in programs to try to train them, but they first need to see it from mom and dad. And children, I'm not gonna go into this a lot, but children know what's important to mom and dad. They know 
the values that they see. And they recognize the values. They know if God is important in our lives or not. They know what drives us. And, and they can see that. And so I think it's important that we as parents do our part. So it's not really the church's job or the school's job to train our children. I think it's our job as parents. And I'd just like to challenge us with that this morning. I would also like to say this morning that I want to go more to the heart of this subject rather than give specific details. And so that's kind of where we're, we're headed this morning. I'd like to first of all read some verses that the Bible gives us. Ephesians 6 verses 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. I'd like to point out two words there. We are supposed to bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. That's important. Nurture is what? What do you do when you nurture something? You, go ahead. You were going to say something. To care, for. care for. You very carefully. If you nurture a plant, what do you do? You make sure it has sunshine. You make sure it has the proper nutrients to grow. And you just give it everything it needs to just go. That's how we as parents should be for our children. And not just to grow physically, but to grow spiritually. That should be our main focus. And we'll get to that a little bit later. Okay, what is admonition? Someone tell me. Correction, teaching, yeah, encouragement, all of those things. I think we know what admonition is. It's correction. It's teaching them. It's admonishing them, encouraging them. Those are things that are very important, and I'd like, I just wanted to point that out. The next verse I want to read is Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. What does it mean to train? Anyone? Give direction. Anything else? Lead. Okay, what else? I would like to put a picture in our mind. How many of you are familiar with, I'm not even sure if I know how to pronounce it right, bonsai, is that pronounced right? More or less? Are you familiar with what I'm talking about? They take these little trees and, and they bend them into all kinds of shapes and twist them and you put them in knots and all kinds of things. And you train that tree and it kind of stays that way. You, you can just do all kinds of things with the, with the trunk of the tree and the branches, whatever. And I think you get the picture. How does that tree learn to do that? By what? It's bent in a certain direction. And it's taught that that's the way you grow. And then it's taught to grow back another way and, and all of that. I would like to get a picture that that's really what God wants us to do as parents for our children. To give them a certain direction, a, a, a certain bend in life, if you want to say it that way. So that we can train them to go toward Christ. Go toward spiritual things. And that's important. Again, we'll talk more about that later. But that's important for us. Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 through 7. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our Lord is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by, thy way, by the way, and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. I read that verse specifically for one reason. It's a constant job. From the time you get up in the morning till the time you lay down at night. It should be our desire and it's our responsibility to teach and train our children. That's important. You know, in the world around us, a lot of people think, that training children is a hopeless situation. They look at it from a very, how would you say, hopeless angle. You know, parents feel children in their ter uh, fear children in their terrible twos. As the children are young, 
they're concerned and worried about what's going to happen when the children are adolescents. And parents of teens continually remind them that their day is coming. We, we know what happens around us. That's kind of the, the attitude that you just can't help these children. They grow up and they are how they are and, you know, hang on to the reins because here we go. That's kind of the mentality that the world has. And I think God has something so much better. And it's not a hopeless situation. God's word has answers and directions even for our time today. And when the situation looks, even when the situation looks gloomy, uh, gloomy, I think sometimes our culture has influenced us to the point where maybe we think some situations are hopeless. And I think it's important that we understand that God's way is still the best way. His, his ways have not proved inadequate. They're just simply many times not understood properly and not exercised properly. And again, I say I don't have all the answers. God's word does. And I just like us to keep our mind and hearts focused on God's word as we go through our lives. I would like also to point out that every child is different. Children respond differently. Um, some children need more correction instruction than others. Some children respond differently than others. And also every situation is different. Every one of us as families face different things in our lives and our children face different things. That's okay. But God's word still has answers. And I would also like to say that even in spite of of doing everything right, our children still make their own choices. We can't make their choices for them. Our children still make their own choices. But it's our desire and it's our responsibility as parents to point them in the right way. Psalms, I think, talks about arrows in the hands of mighty man. And it's talking about children. And, you know, as we take a bow, an arrow, and we want to shoot an arrow, we pull it back and release it. And it's, it's a little bit the same way when we raise our children. You know, we teach and train them. We point them in the right direction. But once that arrow is released, we no longer have control. They're on their own way. They go their own way. They, they take flight. And they make their own choices. But I would simply like to lay some groundwork for how and why we teach and train our children the way we do. First thing is, I think all of our children we recognize are born with an edemic nature. We don't have to teach them to lie, to fight for their toys, or to hit or scratch each other when something goes wrong. They, that instinct is in them. And so I think we all have to recognize as parents that that is in our children. Our children are not born perfect little human beings in that manner. And it's up to us to teach and train them not to do that. I also believe that everyone, every child is born with an instinct to worship something or someone. That's just our nature. You can go to any pagan culture you want and you will find the people worshiping something. And so as our children are born, that, that is something that's in them. They are to worship something. Now, as our children are little, that most often is the parents. That's who they worship. And, and they adore their parents. And maybe as they grow a little older, they have other peers that they adore. And uh, there's nothing wrong with that. But I think as parents, our responsibility is to teach and train them to not only look up to their peers and even good peers around them, but to eventually focus their attention on Christ and have that as, as their role model. I think that's important for us as parents to, to uh, get across to our children. Even small children, even if they don't understand exactly what's going on, they still, doesn't take them too long, they don't have to be very old until they know there's right and wrong. And I think it's important to recognize that. What we're seeing when they're starting to see right and wrong is we're starting to see that there are spiritual struggles beginning within their hearts. That right and wrong and the decisions they make is a battle for spiritual things, even though they're young and don't understand it. 
And I think we should recognize that and, and teach on those points where we can see it starting to come. Uh, even small children, living for self really doesn't bring any peace. You take a child that just goes over and yanks a toy away from someone else and goes over and sits in a corner. It's not too long that toy really doesn't do them any good, does it? There's no peace there. But, you know, how do you, how do you teach your children that that doesn't bring peace? That's quite a challenge at times, but it's something that children need to learn. I have three points here that I'd like us as parents to consider that would give us a proper biblical vision of our call as godly parents. And these three points are this, being authorities who are kind and selfless. That's number one. Number two is shepherding our children to help them understand themselves in God's world. To help them understand themselves in God's world. And the third point is keeping the gospel in clear view so that at some point they, it can be internalized as the answer to a life of godly character and preservation. That should be our goals as parents. And there are a lot of things and a lot of ways we can come about to, to bring about those goals, but that's what we should look at. Number one is authority. Uh, we already talked a little bit about this, where we live, in authority, we live in a culture where every authority is challenged. And I think that's something that's very real. Every authority is challenged. We don't have to look around, and I'm not going to go into detail here, but... Um, a lot of the people who are in authority today are from the culture that cried anti-authority one generation ago. And it really gets confusing and mixed up because their children have been taught. That's how you do. And now they're in authority and we have a kind of a mess in society. Because of this common how would you say, not really a teaching, but mentality in our culture, the father is no longer the head of the home. His position of leadership may even be challenged by his own wife. And I'm bringing this in because I think number one is husband and wife need to agree and work together to train children. There cannot be a disagreement there. If there's a disagreement there, your children will have to pick sides. And that's already a fail Number one, if you're trying to raise your children. Also, I, I would, didn't think of this earlier, but someone has said that the best thing a father can do in a home is to love their mother when you teach your children. The best thing a father can do is to love their mother. And that does quite a few things. Uh, well, one of the points we're going to get to here is, and I'll just maybe I'll just say it right now. Uh, Children have to recognize that we as parents are operating under God's authority. And that's a big part of this first point, uh, being authorities who are kind and selfless. We as parents have to operate under God's authority. Our children have to understand that what we are requiring of them is not for my benefit, but it's because of what God wants me to teach them. You see the difference there? God wants me to teach you to obey me because that's what God said. God said, children, obey your parents. We just read the verse. So because God wants you to do that, I'm going to ask that of you. You see, that's operating as an authority under God's authority. And it's important for children to see that. Of course, when they're little tiny, you know, we teach and train them, don't touch that or don't do this or don't do that. And that's important. But we're teaching them to obey. And then as they get a little bit older and they start seeing us obeying God, because that's what God wants of us, and then we're asking things of them too that God is asking of them. It's important that the children get a grip of that because that is, a, that is one of the important elements to teach and train our children to follow God. Because they are taught to follow God now, not follow me. There's a big difference there, and I think it has a lifelong impact on what our children glean from us as parents, and I think that's important. Uh, another thing, well, let's leave that for now. Uh, 
it seems like our culture kind of is imbalanced in this idea of authority. It seems like there's either the authoritarian type where it's more like a king who is ruling and you're going to do this and you're going to do that. Or it's the other extreme, which is the passive kind. It's like, well, whatever you decide, you can do whatever you want and you know, we'll just go along with it. We'll support you, whatever. Both of those extremes do not bring good results. The authoritarian type or the passive type. Now, I'm not saying that there can't be children raised and they turn out well from those situations, but if we look at statistics, they do not have really good results. The best result is when we follow God's way. That's the highest ratio, the highest percentage of raising children in a right way. But it seems like our culture drives those authorities to the two, way, two extremes, either the, the authoritarian stream or the other extreme. And I think it's important to recognize that neither one of those two work. It doesn't matter if you're in government, if it's in the workplace, if it's church leadership, it doesn't matter. None of those extremes work. It's just a matter of being in God's place and doing things God's way because this is what God requires of me. When I operate under that mentality, it brings about God's results. So I would like to point out that both of those extremes are actually unbiblical, if we want to look at it honestly. They're actually unbiblical. It's not God's way. It's culture's way of dealing with things. Uh, what God is looking for is kind and selfless parents. And so many times parents are tempted to require things of their children because of the parent's image or we want, to, we want our children to be in line so that people looking at us see us as doing the right thing. Those things are not selfless. It's selfless when we follow God's way and we teach them God's principles and we are in authority under God. Uh, we are God's agents to direct God's children on God's behalf for their good. They're not our children, they're God's. And God has placed the responsibility on us to teach and train them and, and point them back to Him because they're His already in the beginning. God has just entrusted them to us, even though they are as precious as they are to us as parents. <clears throat> But God has directed us as his servants to direct his children who are born with evil, evil natures back to him. And that's where the challenge comes in as parents. Take these little children who are born with evil natures and bring them back to him. Um, our goal as parents is not to hold our children under power, but to empower them to become self-controlled people living freely under the authority of God. Now, there's a lot in that statement, but that's really where we want to take our children. Not that they live under our thumb, but that they live freely under God's authority and worship and serve Him. That's important. Uh, the second point is shepherding our children to help them understand themselves in God's world. Shepherding uh, is an interesting thing, but it's probably the best description that we as parents have could be given as in our responsible roles. Shepherding. What does a shepherd do? Looks after the welfare of the flock. What more needs to be said for parents? If we have the best interest of the child in mind, then we will find a proper role, I think. It will go a long ways to help us. You see, God wants us to help our children understand themselves, understand who they are in God's world. And that's important. They have to understand who they are. They have to come to a point where they understand that they have within themselves a fallen nature that wants to make them do certain things. They have to understand that. And they have to understand that that comes from within it doesn't come from because so-and-so did something to me, that's why I did it. No. It happens because I have a nature within me that responded in a negative way. 
And we have to somehow bring our children to that point. We have to be able to help him assess that his fallen nature and his responses come from within, not because of circumstances. We have to help him understand that he has thoughts and evil intentions that, are, that he was born with and they're in his heart. And there's a remedy for that. But we have to help him understand that it comes from within. In Matthew chapter 7, there are a few verses. I'm going to read verses 1, 21 through 23, and I should read more, but for sake of time, I won't. But it says this, For from within, out of the heart of man, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, and it goes on. But verse 23 says, All these evil things come from within and defile the man. And I can't stress this enough. We need to teach our children to have a proper response to life circumstances and not have them fail at that point. Those are teaching moments. And I believe that every child faces certain things, and they all face different things. But they face certain things so that parents can teach them how to respond properly. And in the overall picture, God is shaping and molding that child to be a specific servant of his in life. And I believe everyone, as they face different circumstances, different circumstances, God is preparing them for a work later in life. And that molding and shaping is, is different than someone over here because God is providing them and teaching them for a different work. And I think it's us as parents' as responsibility to have them as they face things and as things come their direction, have them understand exactly what's going on and have them develop a proper response to what's going on. I think that's important. And it's a challenge at times. I'll, I'll just say that that much. Children need not only to understand the external, what they did wrong, but they also need to understand why they did it. It's because of the evil heart that made them do something wrong. Children also need to come to a point where they understand that God works from the inside and to just be well behaved on the outside is not enough. That's another important thing that children need to learn. Children need to understand that their actions are not just behavioral problems but the response of a sinful heart. And we need to teach and train them how to discern what's going on and how to understand and deal with what's going on in their heart so that their behavior and their actions become what God wants them to be. And I could give a lot of examples on, in this, but I think we understand what we're talking about here. We need to help him to discover the answer to man's problem is Christ. The answer to man's problem is a change of heart, not just a change on the outside, not just fall into line so that everything looks good, but it requires a change of heart. And that's where we want to point our children to as we teach and train them. That's, that's the ultimate goal, is to bring them to that point. We need to keep the gospel in clear view so that at some point it can be internalized as the answer to a life of godly character. That's where we need to point them to. Uh, in order to biblically teach and train our children, we need to understand them properly. Children are the product of two things. Uh, his life experiences, I've already mentioned that, and how he responds and relates to those. Those two things are the teaching points that we need to help them to understand. Uh, you know, there are a lot of things that Im impact us as families and especially as children. Children are very, how would you say, teachable, but they're also very, um, I'm, I'm not sure how I, how I can explain it, but things that happen that we think are small are huge in their life. And, and it definitely affects their life. And we need to understand that. And so when small things happen in their life, they need direction at those points. I'm just going to mention a few things that happen. You know, we have family structure. We have children. We have parents, grandchildren, and on and on. Aunts and uncles and cousins and whatever. 
And sometimes those things change. What if there's a death in the family? You know, we as parents sometimes don't realize the impact that those things have on our children. Uh, family values. What is important to parents? Is it money? Is it our house? Is it spiritual things? Is it church? Those things are things that children pick up on and they realize what happens. Another thing, family roles. Who's in charge? Who makes major decisions? Who does the chores? Those are things that are important. Family conflict resolution. Two children get in a, in a, in a squabble. How do we settle it? Those are things that impact children and it's a good teaching moment. Another thing, a family response to a child's behavior. Children will make mistakes. We make mistakes, don't we, as adults? We should definitely affect our children, expect our children to. But how do the rest of us respond when our children make a mistake? You know, do we become critical? Or are we there to just take our child by the arm and say, you know, we messed up, but let's do it right the next time and we'll show them exactly how to do it. That's much better. But those things affect our children. The family umbrella. What, is, what are children sheltered from? Outside influences? What about the nasty neighbor? What about things that happen that are negative? Even things that happen in our world that are negative. I think children need to be sheltered from that at times. There's all kinds of things, literature, music, all kinds of things that have negative impacts on our children. We should look for the positive things. Family history has a lot to do with it. How, how many times do we move to a new community or maybe a new neighbor shows up or marriages, deaths, births, you know, all these things. It's an adjustment for a small child and they're big things in their lives. We had the example of Joseph this morning. You know, Joseph was one that I think God used his father to develop a lot of character in Joseph. And as Joseph was sold off, that character lived on. And I think that's a very, very good example that we as parents can be challenged by. Joseph obviously had a godly father and mother. And he was obviously taught in a right direction. And we can look at the life of, life of Joseph and see many beautiful things in that. Children are a little bit like clay. You know, the potter can take the clay and he can shape it. But sometimes the clay needs a little special shaping. And sometimes the clay goes in a little different direction than the potter would really like to take it. How many of you have ever done that? It's my understanding, I've never done it myself, but it's my understanding that certain types of clay, if it doesn't go just right, it's kind of hard to, to develop it into something exactly how the potter would like it. But as he's going, something else beautiful comes out of it. And sometimes we as parents, we have this idea exactly how our children are going to be. And so we have this mental picture and our goal is to drive them to be just that. But, you know, maybe God has something else for them. And we as parents need to understand that. That, yes, we want them to be Christians and all that, of course. But, you know, there are certain things that they hold as high priorities that may be a big thing in their life later on. We need to be able to understand and, and kind of allow them to shape themselves. You know, my children, I was a carpenter growing up. My children don't have to be carpenters. If they want to be, that's great. But you know what I'm saying by that. Sometimes we get this mental picture that this is what my child's going to be. And so we try to drive them through to that. And it can become frustrating for the children. I think we should be careful with that in, in those ways. There's a lot that could be said here. But Scripture tells us that we respond according to our heart. And therefore, it says in Proverbs 4.23, Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. I think it's important to understand 
that our children's hearts are what is going to develop their character. And so the focus is on their heart, not just on behavior. The focus is on the heart. And I think it's important to teach our children from that perspective. There's a lot more that could be said. I think I'm going to leave off at, on that point uh, by right now. But uh, there are a lot of shaping influences that children face. But I think it's our responsibility as parents to give them a Godward orientation as they face those things and those challenges. Help them come out on, on God's side. Help them develop that. And it will, be a, it will go a long ways in helping them develop the principle that they need God in their lives because they see us following that. And I think that's important. I have a list of some things here that I put together that I think are important to teach our children. Now, these are uh, somewhat general, but I think, I think there are important aspects that our children need to learn. The number one is submission and obedience. We have already mentioned that a nature of a children is to be unrestrained. Our children need to learn submission and obedience. It's very simple, but it's something that they need to learn. Number two, the meaning of the word no. The meaning of a word no. It's very simple. When you say no, that's it. And I've seen children already that were being trained. You say no, and they keep doing it. And the parents say no, no, no. And finally, it's no way you're going to quit. And they start yelling. And the children know that that's the point where you've got to stop no. I think it's simple. Just teach them that no means no. And it, it will go a long ways in them learning that when God says no, the answer is no. Don't try God. Follow God. And see, that's the principle And that's what I'm referring to all along, that they need to learn that our goal is to teach them to follow God. And when God says no, that means no. Number three, they need to be taught that discipline and correction are for their good. It's not for my benefit. Discipline and correction are for their good. How many of you as parents who have some experience in teaching and training children... You've ever noticed that your child did something they weren't supposed to and you punish them. Maybe it's a spanking or whatever the punishment is. Have you ever noticed afterward? And I, this is one I didn't do. And I'm, I'm going to give it because I've learned since we've raised our children. When our children do something bad and it's time to administer a spanking or whatever it is, I think it's good to make sure we have the right spirit before we do that. Number two is I think we should be careful how we do it. You know, there are all kinds of things that parents have done in the past, and I've probably been guilty of it myself, child abuse. You know, God has provided a place where we can spank our children that it doesn't injure them physically other than a little pain. But I think it can be taken too far. I think we need to be very aware of that. I think... It doesn't take a lot. It just takes a fact that they can see that we're following God's order. I think that's the important thing. But have you ever noticed, well, I I missed it here. I should go on with that. I think it's important to, to after the punishment, to have a prayer with the child. I think that's important. And I also think it's important to have an embrace with the child after everything is done. I think that's important. Again, these are things that I learned since I raised some of my children, some of these points. But I think those are good things. But have you ever noticed as parents, and here I'll go back to the question I started with, have you ever noticed that after that experience, there is a release? I think psychologically, our children benefit from being disciplined. Because the sin has been paid for. Do you know what I mean by that? They have paid the price for the wrong. And I think to withhold a punishment, whatever it is, I think does not give them that freedom of heart that they long for. Does it need to be something extreme? No, it doesn't have to be. But I think the children need that psychological release 
that their sin has been paid for. Someday, when they come to Christ and say, God, I'm sorry, that sin is taken away. It's something that they can now relate to and understand. And I think it's good to understand that. Although, they will have to understand that Christ took the suffering, the pain. He did that for them. It's there. It's for their, it's for their taking. But they understand the freedom that comes from that. I'm sorry, I got off track there. But I thought that was important to mention. Uh, point number four. Discipline and correction are necessary because of their evil nature in their heart. That's important for the child to understand. Number five, godly instruction and correction are vital, are a vital preparation for life. It's not just for now, but it's that they understand that life later, they will benefit from that. Number six, they need to have, they need to understand the value of having God's approval over man's approval. Number seven, they need to have respect for all in authority. I think that's important for all in authority, even maybe people that really don't affect them. Say there's maybe a township trustee that they don't think anything of, doesn't, doesn't really affect their lives at all maybe, but they need to have respect for that person or the sheriff or the policeman or the governor or whoever. They need to develop a respect for authority. Another one, number eight, respect for elders. Because the elderly a lot of times have a lot of wisdom, but they need to respect elders. Another thing children need to learn is the value of a person or a soul. They need to value people. Number 10, the importance of right and wrong. Most things in life are not gray. A lot of things in life we tend to look at them as right now. And I've often said it's more important to look at something that you're considering. Is this right or wrong? What is it going to do 100 years from now? That's more important than what it affects me right now. But things in life are not right. Things in life are right or wrong. There's not a lot of gray areas. There are, of course, things that we make decisions in that really don't matter. But there are things that are right and wrong. We need to learn to... Look at them in the right way. The next thing we need to teach our children, why we do what we do. Why we do what we do. It's so easy for us as parents to say, well, you've got to do it this way. Well, why? Because you've missed a teaching moment. You need to stop and sit down with your children and take the time to explain why. You know what? That takes a lot of time. And we might be busy. We might have something else to do. But really, what is most important? I think it's a challenge to us as parents. Number 12, they need to learn the value of honesty and truthfulness. We need to teach that. Number 13 is a big one. They need to learn that life is not always fair. Life is not always fair. Is life always fair to you? No. Our children need to learn that. There are things that we can control, but there are things that are out of our control. And there are things that happen. Life has its disappointments. But some things must just be accepted. Some things must, we must learn to forgive some things. Just let them be. Just forgive and go on. Life has things that happen that once it's done, it's done. Someone has said you can't cry over spilled milk. You know, if I spill milk on the floor, I can lament the fact that I spilled milk. I, I'm sorry I did it. But, you know, the milk is still on the floor. It's still spilled. It needs cleaned up. The milk is gone. If I wanted milk for my cereal or if my wife wanted milk for the cereal, it's gone. She could cry all day about the milk, but that doesn't change it. It's already happened. And life has those kinds of things where something happens and we could, we could just allow that to affect us the rest of our lives. But God wants us to just lay it down, forgive it, and move on. And it's so important to learn that as small children. If we don't learn it as small children and we grow up, it's going to be a problem later in life. But it's something that's important. Point number 14, what we should teach our children is they, that they can't always have their own way. You know, so many times in lives, in our lives, for instance, in church, 
we as a church sometimes make a decision. And it may be that not everyone has the same thing in mind, but collectively we make a decision and then we all jump in and that's the decision, so that's the direction we're going. And I think it's important to learn that we can't always have our own way. But there is also, Scripture tells us that there is safety in a group making a decision together. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Number 15, contentment. Be content with what we have. You know, if we're always looking around to the neighbors and try to keep up with the neighbors, we'll never accomplish it. Just be content with what you have. You don't have to have everything. Some things in life are really nice, but we don't have to always have everything. There's always going to be someone that has something we don't have. So let's remember that. Number 16, bigger and better and faster is not always better. I read that wrong. Yeah, bigger, better, and faster is not always better. Sometimes we look for the easy way to do things, but it's not always better. Number 17, doing things right. When I was working for Stewart, there was a sign in the office hanging behind the desk. It says, if you don't have time to do it right, when will you have time to do it over? If you don't have time to do it right, when will you have time to do it over? There's a lot of truth in that. Teach your children to learn to do things right. I think that's important. Number 18, frugality. To be frugal. That does not mean to be miserly, but to just be thrifty. To just do things in a way that, you know, don't just waste things. Number 19, value and proper perspective of money and other possessions. It's important for children to learn that. And you can't teach that to a two-year-old, of course, but as they grow up, they grow into that. Number 20, a wise use of time. I think that's important. Number 21, life requires work. You'll never get anywhere in life if you're not going to put forth any effort. It just won't happen. Life requires work. Number 22, privileges come only with responsibility. Privileges come only with responsibility. I think our children should be given privileges but only as they earn them. Let them work for them a little bit. And then when they do a good job, reward them. I think that's important. Number 23 is another big one, the value of making corrections. The value of making corrections. If you do something wrong, make it right. If you discover you're doing something that's not right and whatever, you have the ability to turn around and do it another way. That's not easy for some people to do, but our children need to learn that. That if you discover you're doing something wrong, make an adjustment. Do whatever is needed to turn that around and go the other direction. Acknowledging failures and mistakes is a big part of learning how to turn around and then not only just turn around, but to learn from those mistakes. But acknowledging the fact that it was wrong. It's the wrong direction. I think that's important. Another thing I think is important is, is teaching communication skills. Being able to talk and dialogue openly. You know, so many times we as parents, we don't really explain things and our children would benefit from just an open discussion. Just openly discuss it. Sometimes they're afraid to ask because they're afraid of what the answer might be. Or they're afraid they'll get us on the wrong side of things and get us upset by their questions. That should never happen. Be able to discuss things with them. The police department of Texas drew up a list of 12 rules for raising delinquent children. Number one, begin with infancy to give the child everything he wants. In this way, he will grow up to believe the world owes him a living. Number two, when he picks up bad words, laugh at him. This will make him think he's cute. It will also encourage him to pick up cuter phrases that will blow off the top of your head later. Number three, never give him any spiritual training. Wait till he is 21 and then let him decide for himself. Number four, avoid the use of wrong. It may develop a guilt complex. 
This will condition him to believe later when he is arrested for stealing a card that society is against him and he is being persecuted. Number five, pick up everything he leaves lying around, books, shoes, and clothing. Do everything for him so he will be experienced in throwing all responsibility onto others. Number six, let him read any printed matter he can get his hands on. Be careful that the silverware and drinking glasses are sterilized, but let his mind feed on garbage. Number seven, quarrel frequently in the presence of your children. In this way, they will not be too shocked when the home is broken up later. Number eight, give the child all the spending money he wants. Never let him earn his own. Why should he have, to, why should he have things as tough as you had them? Number nine, satisfy his every craving for food, drink, and comfort. See that every essential desire is gratified. Denial may lead to harmful frustration. Number 10, take his part against neighbors, teachers, and policemen. They are all just prejudiced against your child anyway. Number 11, when he gets into trouble, apologize for yourself by saying, I could never do anything with him anyway. Number 12, prepare for a life of grief. You will be apt to have it. I found that in The, the Christian Family, the book by Larry Christ Christofferson. That's from a police department. That's not from any church leader. But it's a challenge to raise our children. Maybe God, may God bless us to have a proper attitude, not only toward our children, but toward him, so that we can raise our children and point them in his direction. May God bless all of us as parents. Darren, I'll turn the time back to you.